thank you for adjusting with us on the fly here. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for coming out today uh, to spend some time with us and hear a, a, a great story from a, from a great lady. So it's truly uh, my distinct honor to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker today, Ms. Kristen Christie. And what she's going to do today, she's going to share a story with you about um, sadness, about resiliency, and about hope. So without further ado, uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round, a huge round of applause for Ms. Kristen Christie. And thanks for rolling with the punches um, to change the room. So I say, God gave me these hips so I can roll with the punches because that's the only excuse I have. <laughs> uh, but today I just want to tell you my story. And I want to tell you, um, and, and I'm hoping that by telling you my story, something will resonate with you. But I have to say, I'm really excited because my dad is here from Iowa. This is the first time he... This is the first time he's hearing my presentation. So I'm a little nervous. Um, so be kind, don't break me too hard. I was fortunate enough to grow up in the Air Force. My dad spent 32 years. We were stationed here at Lackland. This has been old home week for us. We moved every two years. He was with Electronic Security Command at Kelly Air Force Base. And it was every two years, about every two years that we, we moved. Except here in San Antonio, we were here for six years, but he had three different jobs. But two things that my brother and I grew up with that our parents instilled in us. One, if you don't ask, the answer's no. If you ask, you have a chance. If you have a chance, take it. And if it changes your life, let it. And the other one was we got embedded in our community. We had 24 months. We got those boxes unpacked, and we got to know our community. We would get lost. Whether it was Omaha, Nebraska, or Okinawa, Japan, or San Vito, Italy, or San Antonio, Texas. We got embedded in our community, and let me tell you, we met the most fascinating people. We had the most fascinating experiences. And our community grew and grew with every PCS. And that community would later come around alongside of us when we needed them the most. So I was 15 years old. We were in Wiesbaden, Germany. And I am a type triple A plus 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 personality. I'm an uber extrovert. I know that I can walk into a room and I can suck the air right out of an introvert's lungs. <laughs> and I have to temper that. And I'm called the human exclamation point. And I told my family, that on my tombstone, I want my birth date and my death date with an exclamation point in between. Because I lived my life. I got embedded in my community. And I didn't take no for an answer. And if I got no for an answer, I kept asking until I had the chance and I took it and it changed my life. But at 15 years old, this was my schedule. Get up at four o'clock in the morning. I would go to tennis practice. In fact, I took the bus to tennis practice, and I found out the first time I took the bus, my dad actually followed me. And I'm like, I could have ridden with you. <laughs> but it was a life lesson to get on a German bus and go to tennis practice. And then I would go to my junior year in high school, and then I would go to golf practice, because it was golf season. October of 1983, I had the opportunity to play Steffi Graf in tennis. She was 14, I was 15. She was 98th in the world, I was unranked. <laughs> and I beat her. A week later, 
I won the golf championship for all the DOD high schools in Germany. And I beat the number one boy by five strokes. <laughs> I was very proud of that one. <laughs> I used to be a swimmer, and I had gone to the Junior Olympics a few years before in Tokyo, Japan for butterfly stroke. So think about the strokes that I knew about at 15. The butterfly stroke, the backhand stroke, and the golf stroke. Two weeks after I won that golf championship, I experienced another stroke that for whatever changed my life. I had a massive stroke on the right side of my body. I was born with a malformed vein that typically women who have what I have, it bleeds on the delivery table when they're giving birth. So you'll hear about mom stroking out, they lose mom and baby. So I was very fortunate that it happened when it did. I was young, I had a support system, our community that we were embedded in. We had a firm foundation of faith, and I still do. I am a daughter of a king. And I was in shape, not a shape like I am now. <laughs> My size is TLC, thick like cornbread. But I'm sure everyone loves cornbread, right? And those, those things helped me quite a bit. But it still took me a year and a half to learn to walk. Now I will say, our community in Germany, we were embedded. After two months there, this happened two months after we PCS, but we got embedded in our community. The other community that we were embedded in was San Antonio. Guess where they sent me to have brain surgery? Big Willie. They air back me to Wilford Hall because it was six days after the Beirut bombing of the Marine barracks and lawn stool was chock full. Those neurosurgeons were tag teaming in the hallways and they air backed me here. Our community in San Antonio came alongside of us because we had gotten embedded in our community. So when a year and a half later, I graduated on time from high school. It took a lot of hard work. I learned to walk. My dad would crawl with me. Just as we're, ch we're babies and infants, we have to learn to crawl before we can walk. I had to do it all over again. And I lost my identity. My identity was as an athlete. I was an athlete. I was no longer an athlete. But I had to find a new identity and new avenues for my talents. Occupational therapy, they suggested that I take up sewing. With sewing, you push with your right hand, you pull with your left. My right hand was useless. You would never know that today because it took hard work. So I took, I got to remember, I call it an alligator clip. So I'm from Colorado, but if I call it a roach clip, <laughs> it comes across a little differently. <laughs> an alligator clip <laughs> with dental floss tied to it and a key <coughs> ring tied to the bottom of that. I pushed when I, when I was using my sewing machine, I pushed with my left hand and I pulled with my big left toe. I found a new avenue for my talent. I have 15 copyrights, I have a trademark. I sold hooded towels for children to Bergdorf Goodman. I was having sales in the six figures when I was a young mom because I found a new avenue for my talent. So my scholarships, I didn't have scholarships after that, rightly so. But my dad was so smart when we came to Texas and he became a Texas resident. And I got a full scholarship to the University of Texas in Austin. Welcome. Yep, amen. <laughs> so in, Let's see. Yes, am I pointing back there? How do we get that going? I don't want to laser someone. <laughs> 
<laughs> that wouldn't be good. There we go. There we go. So this was the year that the Longhorns won the football championship. We had to show our Longhorn pride and our burnt orange. 53,000 students in 1985. Largest university population-wise. I'm an extrovert. You would think that that would be okay for me. I needed to find my community. And how did I grow up? I grew up in the Air Force. I grew up in the military. We had joint assignments. I was used to speaking in acronyms. So I hung out at the RTC building. That was my community. That's where I felt comfortable. Didn't matter what uniform they were wearing. And I went to an RTC party, and there was one person I didn't know. So I made a beeline right to him, and I said, hi, I'm Kristen Anderson. He said, hi, I'm Don Christie. I guess I was staying a little close. <laughs> he said, we can never get married. What kind of pickup line is that? <laughs> he saw the confused look on my face, and he said, you would be Kristen Christie. <laughs> so the doctors had told my parents when I had my stroke that if I lived, I would never walk again. I did not take no for an answer from the doctors, and I was not taking no from Dawn. <laughs> Five months later, we were engaged. Two years later, we got married when he was commissioned, and we moved to Grand Forks, North Dakota. And we got embedded in our community. We were a young married couple, and we started our family there. Now, those of you who are familiar with Grand Forks, Grand Forks, the base is 17 miles away from town. And it's cold. They have the polar vortex. They call that Tuesday. <laughs> you stay on base and you get embedded in your community. And we got embedded in our community. And we had Ryan, our oldest son, there. You know those TY gremlins creep up? He was a missileer, full and alert. And that's when, when he's off in the the field, that's when the basement floods, and I'm eight months pregnant and can't do much. But our community came alongside of us. And we came alongside of our community. We became each other's safety net. And whether that's one person as your safety net in your community, a handful of people, or a room full of people, it's however you're wired. Whatever that looks like for you. But you've got one. And that's where we need to reach out to one another. To be that for one another. So, we had Ryan. I was eight months pregnant and we got orders for Colorado Springs. Beautiful place. We were so excited. We moved to Colorado Springs in 95. And he was stationed out at Schriever Air Force Base. It wasn't Schriever back then. It was Falcon. But out pretty remote, and we got embedded in our community. We lived off base, so that was our community. We church shopped in Colorado Springs, that's pretty easy to do, <laughs> where the economy is based on God and peacekeeping between all the military bases and all the faith-based nonprofits there. But we also got embedded in three SOPs. That was his unit. They didn't have base housing out at Schreiber. So our aperture got a lot bigger than just our neighborhood and just our church. But in 97, he came home and he said, I think I want to separate from the Air Force. My world was crashing down on me. That was the only way of life I knew. I didn't know anything else. He said, hold on, there's something called the Air Force Reserve. So he joined the reserve as a traditional reservist. And he became a contractor in the same office he was working in, active duty. And then the reserve called him up and asked him to help start the three tent space group out of Schreiber. So he's a, he was a plank holder with that. Our family was a plank holder and our family helped come up with the motto, family of professionals. Family is the first word in the motto. Family of professionals. Started from the ground up. And he became a, 
became full-time reserve and he became a squadron commander. And in 2003, as commander of 19 SOPs in Colorado Springs, the largest reserve unit in Air Force Reserve Command, he came home and he said, Kristen, I am tasked with getting volunteers for a deployment to Baghdad. And I don't feel right asking for volunteers unless my name is the first one on the list. That's leadership. A manager, a supervisor will say go. A leader says let's go. He was willing to put his name on that list at the top of the list. And he was the only one chosen. 2004, he deployed to Baghdad. He was second in command of the Baghdad airport. He had a lot of duties as second in command of the airport. But one of those was the human remains, to make sure that each one of those flag-draped coffins had a respectful and dignified transport home to their family. And that weighed on him when he came home. See, what drove me to go introduce myself to him at that party, not just because it bothered me that there was someone in the room I didn't know, he had something in his eyes, and I can look into his soul. He was transparent, and I loved that about him. But that transparency was gone when he came home. And I tried. We have the pre-deployment, the post-deployment. We get together during the deployment. And communication is so very important. They talk about that. Communicate, communicate, communicate. I'm a much better communicator. In fact, my kids think that my speech therapist did such a good job <laughs> getting me to speak <laughs> that I should have given her a tip. But we did communicate. What we found was he had experiences over there that I will never understand. And it's not that he couldn't tell me because of security clearances or anything like that. It was just he couldn't talk about it. And we call those sacred spaces. We all have sacred spaces. But we just need to understand that. We need to understand with our partner, with our community, with our family, that we have sacred spaces. And it's okay to have those, but we need to communicate that with one another. Don came home, things were stressful, but he was picked up for Army War College. We thought, yes. So when my dad was at Air War College, we went to Maxwell as a family, and it was a wonderful year for us. I delivered the base newspaper. We would go Thursday nights to the dining facility as our family, as our community. I thought this would be a great opportunity for us to go to Carlisle. So we sold our house that we built in Colorado Springs because we assumed that we were going to stay there forever. And we moved to Carlisle. And we were told that we were going to the Pentagon afterwards. Now, a lot of people don't care about DC and moving to the Pentagon where you walk in the door and the air is sucked out of your lungs, right? And all joy, embrace the suck, <laughs> you know, when you walk in the door. But we were looking forward to it because it was another adventure and it was another community that we would get to know. Six weeks before graduation at Carlisle, the Air Force <gasps> changed their mind. That doesn't happen very often, does it? <laughs> they said, no, we need you back in Colorado Springs at Air Force Base Camp. So 11 months after we moved, after we sold our home, we moved back to Colorado Springs. And I will admit, that was the toughest PCS for our family. 11 months, our community, our family continued on. Life went on. And we were trying to get back into that community. And that was tough. Three years is a little easier. People transitioned in and out, right, of the base. 11 months. 
I likened it to double dutch jump rope, where you've got the two jump ropes going and you are trying to figure out where you're going to jump in without tripping. And we tripped. Our marriage crumbled, our family was decimated. And in April of 2008, the coroner came knocking at our door. Don had taken his life. Our kids were 12 and 14. Single mom, I can't be a parent to both boys. I can't be a mom and a dad. But our community came alongside. And it wasn't just the Colorado Springs community. But it's something that will live with us for the rest of our lives. Our youngest son, Ben, eight years after Don's suicide, on his 20th birthday, sent me a voice note. and our community came alongside of us. What Don didn't realize was that his suicide would trigger bipolar in Ryan. Bipolar typically <coughs> presents itself in the early to mid-twenties. I think if Ryan had had those years to mature, that things would have been very different. He wouldn't have gotten into drugs. 
into meth and heroin. He disappeared of his own accord. When we found out that he did not arrive to a retreat that he was planning on going to for four months, we found out two months later. I looked through his things that he stored in our garage and there was a book on how to disappear and how to change your identity. I scoured that book. I scoured that book for dog-eared pages. I scoured it for pencil marks. I scoured it for Cheeto thumbprints. Just to get some idea of maybe where he had gone. I have two private eyes who keep an eye out on his social security number and his passport number. But he hasn't used it for in three and a half years. pray that he's okay, that he's resilient, that he is resetting his life. I am here standing on a firm foundation of faith that my son is out there as a productive citizen and he will call home someday when I get the opportunity to do a TV interview or be in, in the public eye, it's not about me, but selfishly, I want my son to see it and to say, I need to contact mom. And I pray that that happens one day because I'm not going to stop doing this. But I am here to tell you, I stand on a firm foundation of faith, on a firm foundation of my community, on a firm foundation of my safety net. To bring you a message of hope, because there's hope. There's a silver lining to everything. I have been graced with natural silver lining in my hair. It came a year after my stroke. It was gray when I was 16. Now it's silver. <laughs> it's all semantics, right? And when I'm cool mom, I'm Rogue from X-Men. <laughs> and when I'm not so cool mom, I'm Corella DeVille. <laughs> I actually got a robe with CD embroidered on it one year. I'm going, you guys are getting cold. <laughs> there's a message of hope. So we live in a world of acronyms. So I will tell you, when we went to Army War College, I was really excited because I was going to learn Army E's. AFSC equals MOS equals rating in the Navy. F and G crosses all the services. <laughs> Everyone knows that acronym. <laughs> but I want to tell you about a few acronyms that helped our family what's left of our family, get through. Oh. Free. I like four-letter words. Golf, beer, wine, free. <laughs> when all four of them are together, whew, it's a party. Foster relationships energetically everywhere. It is hard work even for an uber extrovert. But it comes back tenfold. And it may not come back right away. That silver lining, sometimes we don't know what that silver lining is for that piece of our life. For two hours, two days, two weeks, two years, two decades. We may never know. But we stand on hope knowing that there is a silver lining. But when you foster relationships energetically everywhere, you increase your aperture, you increase your safety net, you increase your community. Now I'm talking about your community and my community, but know that we are each in someone else's community as well. We are part of that family. And when you foster those relationships, It'll come back tenfold. 
one day. And it may not be that you can help someone in your sphere of influence, but you know someone in your sphere that can help someone else in their sphere. The average person without social media, and I'm talking eyeball to eyeball, is with 44 people within their sphere of influence. So if you help one, you're helping 45. The colonel did the math. I don't remember what the number was, but it was huge. If you think about 42, 43,000 uh, going through basic training here at Lackland, Help one, you're helping 45, and then it, it's mind-boggling to think that one person can have an effect. You can imagine what Don's suicide has had an effect. He was a squadron commander, had been a squadron commander. <coughs> but we fostered those relationships, so our, our community came alongside of us when we really needed it. So, okay. So I told you, the doctor said no on walking. Don said no on getting married. I don't take no for an answer very well. If you don't ask, the answer's no. If you ask, you have a chance. What do you have a chance at? A yes or a no, right? No may be the answer. And that's okay. Because it means next opportunity. What is your next opportunity? As a stroke survivor, I was on the National Heart and Stroke Association board in Colorado Springs. And I got a phone call from a friend of mine. Her friend's son, again, that sphere of influence, her friend's son was 19 years old, was a football player in high school, getting ready to graduate, and he had a massive stroke. He was in a wheelchair, and it was uh, as a result, result of heroin use. He said it was the, the first time, but he was going through depression. His identity was gone. <laughs> so I sat down with him, and I said, what did you like to do before you struck? And he said, I loved football. I went to the University of Texas. You kind of have to like football when you go to UT. <laughs> it's on the application. <laughs> so we talked football a little bit. And I said, can you play football now? He said, have you seen me in the wheelchair? I said, can you play football now? I know the answer is yes, because I just had a conversation with him on football. And he says, I have memorized every playbook for every coach that I played for. I said, you know how to play football. What was his next opportunity? We got him to be an assistant football coach for the Pee Wee League in Colorado Springs for second graders. Mm -hmm. He was in heaven because he was able to play football through them and to teach them football. And he thought that was the only thing he was teaching them. I explained to him, we found new avenues for your talents, but you know what you did for those second graders? You showed them that someone who has a different ability, not a disability, a different ability, can still be a productive citizen. And he taught them so much. He removed that veil of uncertainty for those second graders. Now he's a head football coach for the Pee Wee League, and he's having a ball. He found a new avenue for his talent. So if you are in an, in an AFSC right now or in a position that you love, and for some reason, whatever that reason is, you've got to change, it's OK. They aren't saying no to that. They're saying your next opportunity. And if you can't see what your next opportunity is, that's where your community comes around. Use your community, because they're going to use you when they need you the most. Another four-letter word, fail. I've told you my story. I feel like I failed as a mom. I feel like I failed as a spouse. I know I failed as a community member. 
But when you look at the acronym first attempt in learning, or further attempt in learning, what it does not mean is final attempt in learning. We <coughs> learn from everyday situations. You are never not going to learn. Now my 14 year old came home, my youngest, Ben, came home when he was 14 and he said, Mom, I'm going to be a wise man, not a smart man. I said, what's the difference? Because I'm not smart and I'm not wise. He said, a smart man learns from his own mistakes. A wise man learns from others' mistakes. I want to be a wise woman. I've had to be a smart woman first. And I will continue being a smart woman, making mistakes and failing. I want you to be wise from my story. Learn from my mistakes. Failure is an option, and that means you try. And that's important. But you don't fail alone because you're embedded in that community, right? Next one. And effort never dies. Remember I told you about the silver lining? We don't necessarily know two hours, two days, two weeks, and so on about a silver lining. That effort that we put into something does not die. We have hope that that effort that we're putting into something good, into somebody, into some project, into some mission, That effort is never going to die. It's, it's, it's a legacy if we're doing good things. And that's comforting. The next one is the best four-letter word, hope. Hold on pain eases. If you've heard that acronym before, you've probably heard hold on pain ends. Our pain will never end. It does ease because of the people we surround ourselves with. The people that come alongside of us, our community that we get embedded in. Like the Clemson coach said after they won the championship this year, because there is hope for tomorrow, there is power in today. But there is power in today because we have people that are safety net to come alongside of us. We aren't made to do life alone. God made Eve to be with Adam. Life is more fun when you've got a community and friends and family, whatever that family looks like. It doesn't have to be biological. We're a family. We talk about military family. It starts here. It starts right here at Lackland, at the Gateway. We're a family for life. Because I guarantee you, you're going to run into someone that you've been assigned with years before. So keep your nose clean. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the acronyms that, that really helped me and Ben and our family get through some of the toughest times. You know, we talk about resiliency, and I used to use the Bozo the Clown, the, the blow-up doll with the sand at the bottom of it, and you punch him, and he bounces back, and I thought that was resiliency. It was all about bouncing back. But you've also heard probably the country song, if you're going through hell, keep on going. You go through it. You go through it. That's what resiliency is all about. But I, I challenge you all, as you're going through it, it's a 10 out of 10 on the pain scale. You cannot compare my tragedy with your tragedy with your tragedy. It is a 10 out of 10 on the pain scale, whether it's a lost job opportunity, a broken heart, a death or an illness. It's 10 out of 10. There's no comparison to other people. 
But when we're going through our hell, keep an eye on your rear view mirror, because I guarantee you someone's coming right behind you. Life is a tough teacher. We get the test first, and then we learn the lesson. We get the pop quiz first, and then we learn the lesson. Life is a cruel teacher. Whatever adjective you want to put in there, in all those blanks, we get the test first, we learn the lesson. We become smart or wise, one of the two. But we're always learning the lesson. And we can't always be there for people when they're going through the test and they feel like they failed. What's the L and fail stand for? Lesson, right? We're there to help tutor through that lesson because we've been through something like it. Or we have friends in our, our sphere of influence that have been through it that can help that person. Just like my friend called me to help her friend's son. But now I want to talk to you about what our friends did for us, what our community did for us, what our family did for us. They showed up. They showed up 12 years later, it'll be 12 years in April, since the coroner came to my house. I remember every single person who was standing in my living room. I don't remember what they said. And some of them didn't even come up and talk to us. They stood in the back of the room. But I remember that. They showed up. And then, they did something. It doesn't say, say something. As human beings, we want to fix things, right? That's just the way we're wired. We want to fix it. We want to make it go away. And we don't know how to do that, so we'll try and say something. When we've got that 10 out of 10 headache going on, we don't remember what you say. And it's okay not to say anything. It's okay to say, I don't have the words. But you show up and you do something. So the next morning after the coroner, my friend was in my <coughs> kitchen making pancakes for me and my kids. I hate pancakes. She didn't ask. She didn't ask me, what, what do you want for breakfast? She showed up and she did something. And they were the best tasting pancakes I've ever had because they were made with love. And of course I was going to eat them. I wasn't going to say no. I was going to be polite. My best friend had two boys who were both my kids' best friend. And she came that night when I called her. And she brought a suitcase. And she and her boys stayed with me and my boys for three days. Her kids did not go to school. She actually slept in my bed, on Don's side of the bed. She showed up and she did something. <coughs> Who shops for Mother's Day when your boys are 12 and 14? Usually the dad. My sister-in-law sent me flowers because it was three weeks after Don's funeral was Mother's Day. She sent me flowers. My hairdresser showed up to the house and she cut my boy's hair for the funeral. Another friend came, didn't ask, didn't call ahead, just showed up. She came and took my boy shopping for her suit for the funeral. And then my community from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, from Army War College, my friend showed up on my front doorstep with a suitcase in hand. She lived in Florida. She didn't ask. She just showed up. And she did something. She stayed for a week. And then they were intentional. They were intentional. So 30 days after the tragedy, typically people go on with their lives, and it's okay. Life goes on, right? But I had people that contacted us 45 days later, or 63 days later. They were intentional. We were on their heart. We were on their, their, in their thoughts. So I'm gonna give you all homework. 
And you're going to have a chance to have my personal cell phone number because I don't turn it off. Remember, after Ben's voicemail, I don't turn it off. But what I want you to do tonight is I want you to scroll through your contacts on your cell phone. I want you, it's almost like throwing a dart at your contact list. I want you to find somebody that you haven't connected with in a while and text them. <coughs> Texting is easy. They don't have to answer the phone. They can answer back when they want to. You can do it late at night if you need to. Don't do it late. Well, yes, you can do it late at night, but my phone's not off, remember? <laughs> so, like noon. Put it in your calendar for noon. <laughs> but text them a wave emoji. A, how are you doing? I'm thinking of you. It doesn't have to be long. It's amazing the result you all will find <coughs> in that for yourself and for that person that you choose to contact. I guarantee you 75% of you will get a, a text message back eventually saying you have no idea how I needed to hear from you. How did you know? Were you reading my email? That's God. When he puts someone on, in your thoughts and on your heart, be intentional. Stop what you're doing. Pull over. Put on your hazard lights. I work in a skiff. I will walk out of the skiff and get my cell phone to be intentional. It will come back to you tenfold. And then I want you to go even further Find someone else in your contact list and put on your calendar at just a random time. And if anyone develops apps, come see me afterwards because I have an idea for an app. There's an app for that. I thought it was nap for a while because I really <laughs> like naps, but there's an app for that. And just randomly. It doesn't have to be on the anniversary of anything. If someone pulls out their driver's license, and you have really good eyesight because I don't because it's really small handwriting or small type. But if you see when their birthday is, put it in your calendar with their email address or their telephone number. They will be shocked that you remembered their, their birthday. And not even, how did you find out it was my birthday? Well, I've been stalking you. But, <laughs> but it's amazing because you're giving them an identity. You are letting them know that you were thinking about them. So this is another, I, I grew up with an amazing set of parents. <coughs> my dad was a true leader. And I talk about this dad, so it's not because you're sitting here. <laughs> he taught us to use people's names. People have a name tag for a reason. Now you all in the military have your name tag. Servers and customer service reps have a name tag. Use their name. Look them in the eye after you glance down very, you know, nonchalantly to look to see what their name is. And use their name. It's amazing because you're giving them an identity. You're seeing them. What is the most music to our ears is our first name. With a name like Kristen Christie, I get called Christy a lot. It doesn't bother me. I would change my name. But they're they're calling me. So my dad, long before you had to stop at the gate, when we had <coughs> stickers on the car, my dad would always stop at the gate guard and say good morning, good afternoon. It didn't matter what the weather was. He always <coughs> stopped. And my brother and I would kind of roll our eyes in the back seat. And go, Here he goes again. <laughs> One day, we were stationed in Omaha. He was at Stratcom. And I was in high school, my brother was in middle school. We drive on to Offit, he stops at the gate, chats them up a little bit, and then three minutes later, the sirens were behind us. And my brother and I were like, ooh, you're in trouble. <laughs> he pulls over, a young MP gets out, and he comes up and he says, Colonel Anderson, you didn't do anything wrong. I'm getting married this weekend, and I'd like for you and your wife to come to our wedding. Never forgotten that. He used their name, 
and he made them feel like they were an individual, that they had their own identity. So use that. When you get served at Panera Bread or at Taco, Taco Cabana, if they don't have a name tag, and if you don't know how to pronounce their name, ask them how to pronounce their name. Because you're looking at them as an individual. And be intentional that way. And then use your resources. What are your resources? When I say resources, you're probably thinking the resources on base, which is exactly the next slide. But I want you to also think about your resources, your community, your safety net, your friends, your family, those that you've chosen. We used our resources. It was hard to ask for help. I'm a type AAA plus, plus, plus. And sometimes you have to, because it's not just you. You've got 44 people within your sphere of influence. Could be your kids, your coworkers, but you need to reuse those resources for them as well. So if you all have a cell phone, I'm sure most of you do. These are resources available to you here at Lackland. And you don't have to use all of these resources. Use what's comfortable for you. I went to our chaplain's office. That was my resource. That was where I felt comfortable in my community. And then they were the ones that convinced me to go to Airmen and Family Readiness and our MFLAC and Family Advocacy. I got the information. And the best part is I have that information now to help other people. It's not necessarily what you need, but think about other people in your sphere of influence. So these numbers are available to you. These are your resources, <coughs> along with the people sitting next to you, along with people in your contact list that you're intentional with. Mental health. Look at all of that. That's a full, a full slide. And each of the bases, wherever you PCS to, you're going to have resources like this. Find out what they are. You may not be in crisis, but someone else may be, be in crisis, and they need this. <coughs> you need to help them. Fort Sam Houston. The same resources. So the same names, different phone numbers, right? Hope. Hold on pain eases. This man is my E. Tech Sergeant Sean Lang. We met on Match.com. <laughs> it works. He is my E. I don't know many spouses that can live in the shadow of another life. He understands the value of me traveling, of me talking about Don, of me talking about Ben and Ryan, talking about my previous chapters in life. He is my E. This is Ben, he's so <coughs> handsome. He's 23, he graduates in May from the University of Arizona in Tucson with an aerospace engineering degree. He's been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, and he has a service dog. And the doctors think that that is a result of suicide. So we have to live with choices that someone else made. But we're finding new avenues for our talents. I am your resource. I want to be your resource. I don't turn off my cell phone. Please text me. I get texts from Little Rock. I get texts from Elmendorf and Eilson. I don't necessarily know their names. But they text me because I'm a resource for them. I want to be your Aunt B. <coughs> from the Andy Griffin Show. <laughs> the Suicide Prevention Hotline. So the other numbers were numbers that the, the names stayed the same, but the numbers changed from base to base. This is a number that stays the same, 
but the name changes. You've seen veteran crisis line, you've seen military crisis line, it's all the same number. One number. And it's not for, for only when you're in crisis, it's for someone in your community and your sphere of influence who's in crisis. Because they will help you. They will give you the resources you need to help that person. My Facebook page. I have a three minute public service announcement that has my son's voicemail. It has the fading pictures. It's three minutes. I think it's powerful. Use it, please. The URL is right there. It is open source. Use it if you need to. I want to leave you with, I hope you've heard my message of hope. So it was Air Force Spouse of the Year, and I will tell you that at 1 o'clock today, they announced the 2019 Air Force Spouse of the Year from Seymour Johnson. <coughs> I'm very excited for her, but this has opened up so many doors for me. So for seven years, I have been working on a National Day for Survivors. We are all survivors of something. We've all had that 10 out of 10 on the pain scale. We have a National Ice Cream Day, May 17th. It's every day in my household, but <laughs> officially it's May 17th. We have over 1,500 National Days. Can someone tell me what the date is on Monday? March 4th. What was that? March 4th. And conquer. <laughs> March 4th and conquer. Monday is the National Day for Survivors. I am waiting for a call from the White House to be in the Oval Office on Monday to have Trump sign the National Day for Survivors on March 4th. Because we put one foot in front of the other and we march forth and conquer. Celebrate your survivability and your survivorhood and your resiliency and your resetting after a tragedy. There's hope. Hold on, pain ends. You all be each other's safety. <coughs> and march forth and conquer. <laughs> Thanks. Trainees wash the same door four times. Yeah, yeah. Four to five minutes of presentation. That's good. So you know you're home again. You know you're home again. So the other thing I want to mention is, in our day and age, they use the word hero a lot. And to be frank, they overuse the word hero a lot. Uh, but this is your legacy, sir. And she is a hero. Absolutely. So you look around this room, Chief's room. These are some amazing warrior airmen. She belongs in this room telling that story. That's what it's about. The other thing I want this audience to understand is you don't have to wear the uniform to serve. Because this is what service looks like. Our airmen's creed, 18 lines, 94 words. But it boils down to three. Wingman, leader, warrior. Kristen, you are all of those things and more. And you will always be a warhawk for life. Thank you very much.